Hey, this is Andrew Kuhn, and you're listening to the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Jeff and I talk about actionable stock ideas, timeless investing concepts, and the overall way that we think about investing at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Go to focuscompounding.com and enter in your email to get a free watch list from Jeff every other week. And be sure to check out all of our other work where Jeff writes about stocks at focuscompounding.com. I upload how-to investing videos on YouTube, and we both manage capital for investors at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe to follow along. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting alongside Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else as well. Hey, we are going to be in New York City, November 11th through the 15th. I hope you hear me say that multiple times, as I've been saying that so much Mm -hmm. in the podcast. If you are interested in our money management services and you would like to meet up in person, grab a cup of coffee um, or meet up for some lunch to go over uh, the managed accounts or the fund, reach out to invest at focuscompounding.com. If you want some more information on the fund in general, I guess, and the managed accounts, go to Focus Compounding and then click the invest with us um, uh, link on the header and that will give you everything that you want to know we have our investor presentation up there uh, but yeah so definitely reach out to invest at focuscompounding.com if you'd like to meet up with us so in today's video we are going to be doing a super investor podcast and video i know i said in today's video and i don't think we've ever dedicated a podcast to charlie munger at least that's been uploaded yeah we did actually we dedicate did, a podcast to charlie what, i don't remember did we was it I forget what happened to that. Was it just Some, a bad file? Or I don't something? remember if something went wrong with it. We, we if we have a podcast that um, we try to record and have a problem with, yeah, we don't re-record that exact one because this podcast depends on us giving spontaneous answers and stuff. Totally we don't prepare for this, and uh, it's just impossible to immediately go back and do the same thing as if you haven't just talked for twenty minutes about that. Topic. Yeah, it would be awful. Yeah. So we said, okay, we'll do that in the future, and that was probably like I don't know six months ago at least. Yeah. Um, so like apparently we have a lot of. Uh, good ideas that we've been uh, talking about. But anyway, so Charlie Munger, obviously he's vice chairman, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's right-hand man for you know a very long time. He is the chairman of the Daily Journal, which is a uh, company that Jeff actually uh, wrote up for the website, Focus Compounding. Uh, use the podcast promo code if you want to take a look at that. Um, but you know, his life's been very exceptional. And obviously everyone that follows you know the, the value investing uh, philosophy, is probably a huge fan of him. But what's been so interesting to me is really everything that is outside of investing mm-hmm. with him. And, um, you know, how he has so much different interests in so many different topics that's just completely outside of the investing world. Right. And I actually was lucky enough to go to one of the uh, the Daily Journal meetings uh, a couple of years ago. And so I was able to meet him in person. And after the meeting, there was probably, I don't know, 20 of us sitting al- alongside or really just around him. And there's a bunch of videos of it on YouTube. Some guy uploaded it, all of it. And everyone was just asking him questions for, you know, good, I don't know, hour to hour and a half after the meeting. But it was just, it was very fascinating just to see people be so interested and being so intrigued to be around this guy. And of Mm -hmm. course I was as well. And at um, one point, I think one of his, um, I don't know what you want to call him, one of his guys, he's got a guy, Mm -hmm. came up to Munger and said, uh, you know, it's time to go. And um, Munger kind of like, he you know, said to him, he's like, so many people have come from so far, like, let's mm-hmm. say, and, and talk. And there was people there from, like, China and overseas. So it was just awesome. It was a cool experience. And we're definitely going to be at the next Daily Journal meeting, um, this upcoming one as well. So if you guys want to meet us, uh, we'll, we're, we're, we are planning to be there. Um, but, you know, his life's just been pretty extraordinary. And obviously, Damn Right is a very good book mm-hmm. that's written on his life. Um, poor Charlie's Almanac. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he seems like from a very young age, he was very passionate about getting wealthy. Okay. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's sort of the commonality of a lot of these guys that become like ultra rich. Mm-hmm. They just had sort of a passion for money from a very young age. Right. Which I wonder where that comes from. And you and I, we've kind of talked a lot about this mm-hmm. recently because we, as we talked about on a podcast, we've read Titan which mm-hmm. is with John Rockefeller, and he wanted to be very wealthy from a very early age. Obviously, Buffett wanted to be incredibly wealthy from a very young age. Munger had the same passion. So I was always curious where that comes from. Is it because, and you, you kind of talked about 
that as well, your opinion on it, mm-hmm. about how you think that it's like it was around them, wealth or money may have been around them, right. but maybe they didn't have it themselves or their parents didn't have it themselves. Sure. You know, which could really shape the way that people, um, I guess you could say, aspire to think about money or what they want to achieve in their life. Um, but where do you think that passion came from with him? Because his parents or his grandpa was a pretty wealthy judge. Now, I know when there was a depression, whatever, they had like some depression or something mm-hmm. back then, and his grandpa was able to support his family. So I don't know if his parents directly were wealthy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, all that I know about him seems to be that it was to have independence. Yeah. You know, that he wanted wealth to have independence that way. And he was pretty interested in getting rich fast, although not necessarily c- continuing to compound wealth the same way that Buffett is. You know, he doesn't have that kind of focus on it. But just applying the kind of intelligence that he has and uh, specifically to get it making a lot of money. And I think earlier in his life he did that more yeah. so than later. Yeah. And you actually, I was kind of surprised. You had mentioned to me the other day, we were just talking, I don't remember what it was about, but you had said that you don't think his focus on stocks has even been because i was like what's the relationship you think between them is it really even to this day buffett just calls munger and says hey you know i'm thinking about buying this stock you know what are your if thoughts that, on it or yeah. if that maybe yeah. yeah yeah i think in the past they talked a lot uh and i think that much less so now i mean that's the big difference between buffett and munger is that buffett was 100 percent focused on making money throughout his whole life and compounding and all that and munger was interested in a lot of other things i mean i have mixed feelings about talking about munger generally with investors because i think he People love uh, Munger and the idea of like worldly wisdom and all that sort of thing. And I think that most investors will be better served by a focus on investing stuff, you know, Mm -hmm. by like that reading a lot of things and doing all this stuff is going generally having a lot of general knowledge is they think is going to help them out. Uh, And I think some practical knowledge of a bunch of different things is useful, but kind of learning what you need to know as you realize you're making mistakes and things like that is sometimes more helpful. Mm Mm-hmm. You know? So you're saying like, so like take all the psychological biases out right. that he always talks about. But for example, are you saying that you don't think it's um, that relevant to know, you know, a bunch of physics and right. a bunch of different things about scientists and yes. everything else that he knows? Yeah. Right? And I think that people, I think it's always more fun and, and for people to read more like general interest books and things that are kind of popular science things or whatever uh, than to read another 10K. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was cool. So at the meeting... Some gentleman said to him, Mr. Munger, I want to read a paragraph to you and get your thoughts on it. So he starts reading, you know, this paragraph and Charlie for people that are watching us, he kind of has his head down like this. He's just his eyes closed and he's listening. And then the guy's like, what are your what's your thoughts on that? And he's like, it sounds like a scientist. And then the guy's like, I forget who it was. It was like Edison, Edison or, or mm. Einstein or something like that. I was like, whoa, <laughs> he really does know, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, th- I think it's good to read a lot of things. And yeah. he reads an incredible amount. Uh, but I, you know, I mean, Buffett reads an incredible amount too. I, I don't know that it's, you, you know, I think some of the attraction of, of Charlie Munger for people is the idea that you can learn about all these other things and apply it to investing rather than doing a lot of uh, reading of specific situations. And it's, it's probably different too. I mean, to your point earlier that Munger's probably focused on a, a lot different things now mm-hmm. than he was. I mean, you said you think he was really only focused on investing probably for a short period in his career. Yeah, that that was his main and only focus. Yeah, yeah. I think when he was running the fund. Yeah. You know, and, and so who knows, maybe back then, I mean, people are almost comparing their chapter, you know, one through 10 to his chapter 100, where he's yes. literally at the point now in his life where all he can do is study a bunch of different stuff. You know, he's focused on architecture. He's focused on, you know, a bunch of different studies. Yeah. You know, it's a lot more but, interesting. But when he was actually running his his um you know his partnership himself Mm -hmm. he was probably a lot more focused on yeah absolutely yeah and uh we can look at like what do you do with daily journal because we talked a little about daily journal and there's the presentation that someone gave um which we talked to manual of ideas uh presentation which you uh your twitter has it it does at focus compound so i go to at focus compound and you can find that presentation but that presentation talks about what stocks they think daily journal owns uh the 13f has some of them but it would only have the u.s ones so i think it has adr's Posco, but they probably own a lot of Posco in Korea, um, which is a Korean steel company. And then they have uh, definitely Wells Fargo and Bank of America are, are the really big ones. And I think U.S. Bancor is the other one that they own. And then that um, analysis, that presentation, thinks that the other two stocks that they have are BYD and um, Hyundai, I mm-hmm. think. Um, so the uh, what he did is he bought all of that stuff when the market tanked. So, you know, basically bought huge amounts of those stocks, uh, a 
bet on just a few of them and then has held it ever since then and didn't sell them and you know has borrowed on margin to do other things uh but has kept those positions and that's a good idea idea of like how Munger thinks is that he probably just holds on to cash for a while and then buys a few things that he always liked those companies few when big they're decisions. incredibly cheap. Yeah. In like a moment of panic or something like that. I, I think- mean, even if you look at his personal, I mean, at the, at the meeting, he did say, he said the Mungers, mm-hmm. you know, so his, him and his family money, they own three different, I guess, vehicles as we right. said, Berkshire Hathaway, Costco, which he's on the board of, and then, um, Lilu's fund. Yes. Yep. You know, I thought it was interesting, too, because he gave him, I forget how much it was. Um, you know, I know he, he talked about he invested a couple million dollars out of on the stock that he uh, got out of Barron's. And to your point about, I guess, the the frequency of how much he invests, he mm-hmm. said he read Barron's for 40 years and never got a stock idea out of it. Right. But the one that he did get a stock idea out of, I think he put a couple million in. And then it was like, I forget, more than 10 bagger. It was yeah. like ridiculously. And he took that money and then invested it with Lai Lu. And now it's, you know, compounded to a huge amount of, of money. But, you know, he said that they really only have three different vehicles. Now, of course, you can make the argument, well, Berkshire owns all this sure. stuff. It's kind yeah. of like an index, which is true, but, you know. Yeah, and a stock fund owns different things, too, yeah. Uh, but he's very, very concentrated. I think he said before that, personally, he could live with owning three stocks, and I think mathematically that works out fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, you know, clients and stuff couldn't, so that he, he would own more than that in a, in a fund. Um, I think from what we know about how he ran his fund, he was more aggressive in terms of borrowing and stuff like that, embedding so much on one situation than Buffett was. Mm-hmm. Um... Uh, so he takes concentration even to a more extreme level uh, and focuses on just buying a few things in a really big way. Yeah. Also, maybe more of a focus on certain better businesses. Uh, an example of that, that I don't know how well it worked out and stuff, but POSCO would be a good example of that, of why you would buy that. That's got to be an organizational thing because uh, it's not an industry that you would like a lot and, and things like that. It was cheap, but it has very strong um, sort of technical position in the industry, stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, and BYD is the same sort of situation, probably betting a lot on the uh, on management there and also just the organization. You know, So that's more of a Phil Fisher type thing. I can't imagine Buffett buying BYD. Berkshire owns it, but it's because of Munger, obviously. What do you think about the, I guess, idea that everybody says that you know Munger really shaped Buffett's investing career? And mm-hmm. how we really got them away from the, these statistically cheap stocks to buying these, um, you know, incredibly high quality type of companies. Like, do you think Buffett would have eventually been forced to go that route because he would have just kept on raising more capital yeah. and then obviously all the statistical yeah. bargains would have dried up where he just would have naturally shifted that way? Yes. Or do you think, because I think Munger's even said that he feels like he's, um, I don't know how you want to describe it, like wrongfully... Um, characterized as being this guy that has influenced Buffett's career so much. Yeah. And he's really like Warren would have got there himself. Yeah. It might have taken a little bit longer. And I think probably that. And he, he did say he's like, it would be very hard for Buffett to do it because I mean, the right. guy made what? $30 million doing that. Yes. And then to go from one strategy to something else. I mean, you could obviously see why that would be incredibly tough. Yeah. I think he wanted to do it Buffett and just needed more someone uh, who made a lot of sense to keep saying that you should do this. You and know? what was that for? Was it, it was Amex, probably, right? American Express? Well, experiences, he had experiences in American Express and Disney and things which were temporarily cheap or whatever, but probably taught him more about the the kind of uh, returns that you could get if you bought those businesses and held them for a long time. But he had, uh, you know, he had good results. Um, so it's hard to stop doing something that's working out. Sure. Um, so, you know, uh, even in his partnership letters, though, Buffett starts uh, by the end of the partnership letters to say that the really big money that they've made is on things like American Express. I mean, mm-hmm. he doesn't use the name American Express because he never disclosed that to partners, but um, those kinds of things. But the things that he was able to do more consistently were more of the workouts, the net nets, the things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and one thing that I think is pretty interesting is I wonder if Munger thought about that really because he was taking into consideration the scale, right? So you look at um, guys like David Tepper, for example, I think his fund, he kept, I think, purposely around 10 to 15 billion. Okay. And then whatever they were up, they would just really return the capital mm-hmm. and they would just, you know, really be like a hedge right. fund, I guess you could say, return uh, yeah, performance. Yeah, Graham Newman did that. So yeah, ben Graham, Graham did, did that. that. Um, yeah. Renaissance Technologies, mm-hmm. uh, they, I think they keep their capital around 10 billion. Um, so although, you know, those guys may have better returns than Buffett, I mean, for Buffett to be able to compound at whatever it's been, 20 to 21% over the mm-hmm. amount of time that he has, but at the scale that he has, you know, hundred plus billion dollars, it's just incredible. And I wonder if, you know, a lot of mongers um, focusing on the high quality businesses, if that had to deal with, 
you know, them thinking about the potential scale that it could have. I think that's part of what part of it. moved yeah. Buffett. I think Munger basically is because he didn't learn from Ben Graham. Yeah. I mean, M- Munger came into knowing Buffett and other people who were involved with learning from Ben Graham originally, but Munger didn't. And so he saw more things in Graham that he thought didn't make sense. Yeah. Whereas Buffett learned so much from Graham that I think it was harder for him to see those things. Yeah. But I mean, it's like we talked about OTC markets recently on a podcast and I was saying, well, you know, it tells me that it should be fine to own it at the price that it is for that, you know, at 25 times earnings, this stock is actually as cheap as good as a lot of stocks that I could buy at 13 times earnings, but I don't like paying 25 times earnings. And it takes a lot of effort to move your mind that way to knowing when to expand beyond those things and when to keep to the old rules. I mean, people have asked about Buffett before, like, um, you know, well, that you have to kind of expand into doing different things and to learn those things. That's true, but you have to also be very careful about not, you know, ending up paying any price for things and stuff. So you have to stick to principles too. Your principles have to change very, very slowly. Yeah. And he, I mean, I remember even in the snowball, they quote among her saying, like, I just like the good businesses. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like and how it's very hard for them to buy statistically cheap stuff. And yeah. I just like the good companies. Right. And if that's true, then you have to wait. You usually have to wait a long time to get them at cheap prices. Because the risk, if you pay too much for them, is that even though they can do really well, um, uh, on, average they, on average, if you just bought good businesses, you really wouldn't do that well. Because they're often uh, priced sort of, um, you know, academics call them glamour stocks. They're priced at like growth stocks. They're, they're too expensive often compared to value type things. Now, if you could tell exactly which ones um, won't be too expensive, you know, that have the right future, then you'd be okay. But it's very hard. It, it's very, very hard to like run a constant growth fund or something to think that you're going to be like a growth mutual fund or something, just high quality that you're always going to own high quality companies. It's really, really hard. Uh, whereas it's much, much easier to constantly find value. Now, when you say you really have to wait for cheap prices, Mm -hmm. I mean, what's a cheap price for a great business? (laughs) Because, okay, so to OTCM's, right, Right. the counter market's point, you say even at 25 times uh, earnings, 18 times EV to free cash flow, that's a cheap price. Yeah, I think 15 times for that, for OTC markets. There's a lot of people (laughs) that would say that's, like, incredibly cheap, and you'll never find companies like, uh, you know, good businesses at that price. Eh, maybe, maybe that just shows. I mean, how we much bought computer services at like fifteen times or something. Yeah, it'll yeah. it'll happen sometimes. Yeah. What did Buffett pay for Apple, and then what does Apple trade at some other times? You know, I mean, it does happen. It, it does happen. But yeah, it's true that you'll sometimes never own certain stocks. I mean, I wrote about a bunch of companies a while ago uh, for like a Guru Focus newsletter thing. I don't know, seven eight years ago now, and um, I gave a list of companies uh, of the ones that I really liked, which were Exponent, uh, Ball. Uh, Waters and Copart were the ones that I talked about um, as being really good businesses that I thought had a really clear future, but they weren't that cheap. But I picked them anyway because it was like an automatic screener thing. So I figured I'll just pick the best businesses, the ones that would, I'd be most comfortable with people owning the stock, yeah. regardless of the price, right? But I thought the prices were too high. But as it turned out, if you compare their returns to the market over that time period, you know, you would have been okay paying a high price. But you have to be very careful about that because if you pay too high a price, the multiple can contract while you own it. And, uh, you know, I mean, think how many value investors have done poorly following Buffett into Coke, right? Because he bought Coke, had success with it. But then when did actually most Buffett followers start thinking about, I like Coke as a business and all that, buy into it? They paid, they convinced themselves to pay a very high price for it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that's a price that a Munger or Buffett would actually be buying into it at. What's interesting is that the two different personality types, at least the mm. public persona. I mean, okay. obviously we don't know how they are personally or whatever, but I mean, Munger and Buffett, they really do seem to have two totally different personalities. I get the impression that Munger, he's very much, um, and I think he, they even said it in the snowball, he didn't care what people thought about him. He doesn't care what people mm-hmm. think about him. He just wants to be respected. Okay. Or respected, I'm sorry. He literally said like, he doesn't give a damn what people think. He just wants to be respected. Where Buffett, on the other hand, he's very nice, very culty, <laughs> wants people to like him, doesn't like criticism. Mm-hmm. You know, It's kind of interesting to see how that they've really mashed up together. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how different their internal personality is versus how they present themselves to the public. I think Buffett has tried over time to be very good about how he, uh, learning with dealing with the public, learning with dealing with people, and doing certain things to come off better that way, whereas Munger does the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, over time, if you read Buffett's biography and stuff, I think he's come, become much better at that and is careful about how he does those sorts of things. Um, I relate more to the Munger approach, I think. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about, um, I mean, what's your, 
I guess you could say favorite takeaway from Munger, something that he, you've learned from him that you think like will always apply to your life, something like a principle or the way he thinks. Well, I think you said only buy the good businesses, that he only wants to buy the good businesses. I think that's the right answer. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it probably, if you're doing things for yourself, it doesn't make sense to buy things that aren't good businesses. But the problem is that you'll be able to be so inactive, you'll have to be so inactive that you'll rarely be able to do something on a big scale, but you can. Um, I think running money and stuff, it can be harder to do that, mm-hmm. um, especially because people want a lot of diversification. And I think people like to see some activity. They don't like to see the portfolio look the same from year to year. I mean, look what he did with Daily Journal. He buys things once and then keeps it for 10 years or something, you know? Um, that's something that uh, if you were, if he was managing a fund, I don't think people would like paying him a fee on that. What about non-investing related? <sighs> Since he's so big on non-investing stuff. Uh, well, he always talks about that inverting. And I think that that's probably the best answer for a lot of things in life is to flip around the question. Usually that's true. When you get stuck on something where you don't really know the answer, you can just flip it around to ask the opposite thing. If you know uh, you don't have an, you know, let's say you're trying to find a good solution to something, you ask and say, well, what's the dumbest solution to this problem? Yeah, I think he he used the example of instead of trying to, you know, think about like uh, how to fix India. You should think about, and he used this example, you know, what's killing India and what can we do to avoid that type of thing? It's kind of like his principle of, um, you know, I, I, all I want to know in life is where I'm going to die, so mm-hmm. I'll never go there. Yeah. I think I, that is a principle that I really like. I also like just his overall philosophy on lifelong learning. I think that'll take people, you know, pretty far. Yeah, life. and I think he and Buffett both apply that. It's just that he applies in a more general way. And, and we, and we've, we've, more narrow yeah, way. we've talked about this before. I mean, how, how much... Do you think people read, for example, or continue to learn after college? Like actually pick up a book. The average and, and person is not a nothing. Lot. And yeah. I know they've ran studies on that. So it just goes to show where, you know, if you continue to sort of slug away every single day, you really can, I guess, um, separate yourself from the competition. Yeah. And we talk about all the time. I'm always saying, you know, read a 10K a day to people. Um, the same sort of things with books. You could be reading a book, however, you know, often it depends on if you're listening to audio books and you have your commute and things, you could figure out what you can do it at. But just something that is a continual thing. Um, that's the big part of it is like people always have this idea where they go um, get real excited about it and then do a bunch of things for a while. But, you know, going through 10 10Ks over the next few days or something or reading, you know, an incredible pace of books isn't the same as just for the rest of your life going at a pace where every day you're doing something that way and, and that adds up. And that's really the approach that he has. It's better to be good all of the time instead of great some of the time. Yeah, and have yeah. it be a habit of, like when you're saying lifelong learning, it's lifelong learning as a habit, like yeah. a continual habit every day. Yeah. Mm, no, I love that. So I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Mr. Jeff and myself here today. We are going to be in New York, November 11th through the 15th. As I've said, if you're interested in learning about our money management services, email invest at focusedcompounding.com. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, thumbs this video up, leave us a rating and review. That goes a long way. And we'll see you in the next podcast. Take care. Hey, this is Andrew Kuhn, and that was the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Jeff and I talk about actionable stock ideas, investing concepts, and the overall way that we think about investing at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Go to focuscompounding.com and enter in your email to get a free watch list from Jeff every other week. And be sure to check out all of our other work where Jeff writes about stocks at focuscompounding.com. I upload how-to investing videos on YouTube, and we both manage capital for investors at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe to follow along.